Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me for yet another brief dance history lesson. I've decided to not go chronologically, so I'm going to be jumping around a bit. Today, I'm going to be talking about one of the most influential and prolific choreographers of the 19th century, Marius Petipa. Born in 1818 in Marseille, France, Marius spent much of his early childhood traveling with his family. His mother, Victorine Grasso, was an actress, and his father, Jean Antony, was a renowned ballet master in his own right, and thus the family was often on tour. At the age of seven, his father began to teach him ballet, and by the age of nine, he performed in his first production. The family eventually settled in Belgium, but a revolution in 1830 caused all the theaters to close their doors, taking away his father's job in the process. They then made their way back to France, where Jean Antony got a job as the ballet master for the Grand Theater of Bordeaux. Here, young Marius completed his dance training, and soon he was appointed the premier dancer of the Ballet de Nantes, the highest position a male dancer can hold in a company or the male equivalent of the prima ballerina. At the same time, Marius' older brother Lucien had the coveted role of premier dancer for the Paris Opera Ballet, and Marius would occasionally guest perform alongside his brother. In 1841, Marius moved on from Nantes and became the premier dancer for his father at the Grand Theatre of Bordeaux. This was where he mounted his first full-length productions. But he would not stay long, soon accepting an offer for yet another premier dancer position, this time in Madrid for Teatro Real, a position which he held from 1843 until 1846. This engagement was cut short when he was challenged to a duel by a member of the French embassy, whose wife Marius had been having an affair with. Instead of facing the threat of death in the duel, Marius fled Spain and returned to Paris. He wouldn't stay in Paris for long, though, Within a year, he got in trouble again for yet another affair with a different married woman. In order to once more dodge the repercussions of his actions, Marius used his older brother's connections to land a job in Russia. Lucian called in some favors and got Marius the job as the premier dancer for the Imperial Ballet of St. Petersburg. And possibly going along to keep an eye on his philandering son, Marius's father was also given a job as a teacher at the Imperial Ballet School, a position Jean Antony would hold until his death in 1855. In the 1840s, the Imperial Ballet of St. Petersburg was experiencing a decline in popularity due to the recent departure of the world-renowned ballerina Marie Taglioni. And Marius, along with prima ballerina Yelena Andrianova, breathed new life into the company. In 1849, French choreographer Jules Perrault became the ballet master for the Imperial Theatre, and Petipa not only performed the leading roles in these new productions, but also assisted in the restaging of Perrault's older works such as Giselle and Le Corsaire. At the time, Perrault was the most celebrated choreographer in Europe, and Petipa learned a great deal from him. In 1855, Nearing the end of his career on the stage, Petipa began staging his own works for the Imperial Ballet. These early works were specifically catered to the talents of his first wife, Maria Petipa, who started her career in the corps, but quickly rose through the ranks after marrying Petipa. In 1858, Perrault retired from his position as ballet master. And after years of serving as his assistant, the now 41-year-old Petipa, who had just retired from performing, seemed like the obvious choice for his successor. Alas, he would have to wait a bit longer, as the position would instead be given to another renowned French choreographer, Arthur Saint-Léon. Petipa would remain an assistant, and the rivalry that formed between him and Saint-Léon would go on to fuel his work. One such work, 1862's The Pharaoh's Daughter, was put together in only six weeks an extremely short amount of time to create an entire new ballet from scratch. This was done in order to fulfill a contractual obligation with departing ballerina Carolina Rosati. 
the production was a massive success, feeding into the opulent tastes of Tsarist Russia, and would go on to become the most popular ballet in the Imperial Theatre's repertory. This success earned Petipa a step up to second ballet master under Saint-Léon, and though he technically ranked below him, the two men were now treated as equals. This sparked an arm race between the two, each trying to outdo the other with their newest creation. Each man even had his own prima ballerina who would dance the leads in only his ballets. Petipa working with his wife, and Saint-Léon working with Marfa Maria Veva. As the 1860s came to a close, Petipa began to outpace Saint-Léon, ending the decade on a high with his adaptation of the famous novel Don Quixote, which he originally choreographed for Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet Theater, a production that remains a cornerstone of classical ballet repertory today. Upon Saint-Léon's death in 1871, Petipa was finally named the premier ballet master for the Imperial Theater. And the first work that he produced for the company was an extended restaging of Don Quixote, with much more lavish sets and costumes. Petipa would go on to create many classic works in his time as the premier ballet master, such as the often excerpted Kingdom of the Shades section of Le Bayadere, and his revivals in the 1880s of works such as Piquita, his mentor Perrault's masterpiece Giselle, and Saint-Léon's Coppelia would go on to become the definitive versions of those ballets. Overshadowing the originals, his revivals would go on to set the standard for future productions, reaching as far as the modern day. Petipa's time in St. Petersburg during the twilight of Imperial Russia became known as the Golden Age of Russian Ballet. At the time, there was no shortage of virtuosic dancers, and the lavish productions were funded by the deep pockets of the emperor. In the 1890s, Petipa began working with composer Pyotr Tchaikovsky, and together they would create productions that would prove to be some of their most enduring works. The 1890 production of Sleeping Beauty, which would later serve as inspiration for, and lend much of its music to, the Disney movie of the same name, and the 1892 production of The Nutcracker, a ballet performed by countless ballet companies every December. While his hand in Sleeping Beauty is undeniable, and led to it becoming an instant success. Whether he or his second ballet master, Lev Ivanov, are truly responsible for the Nutcracker is disputed to this day. Petipa was diagnosed with a painful skin condition in 1892, which may have left much of the work on Ivanov's shoulders. In fact, it is often attributed to Ivanov in part due to the negative response from critics, who claimed that it appeared to be a bad imitation of Petipa's earlier work. The Nutcracker wouldn't see success until the 1960s, when it began its rise to becoming the Christmas tradition around the world. Petipa would spend the end of his career, at the turn of the 20th century, reviving his previous works, and putting the finishing touches on them in the form of small alterations. But the aging ballet master was beginning to lose his touch, with new innovations coming to the art form, and a new director of the Imperial Theatre, Vladimir Teleyakovsky, his reign was coming to an end. The two men were constantly at odds, but Petipa's contract and reputation made him impossible to fire. Instead, Teleyakovsky began stripping the ballet master position itself of much of its power. In 1903, after years of butting heads with the director, the 85-year-old Petipa would launch his final production to make it to the stage, The Magic Mirror. Based on the folktale of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the ballet was panned by critics, leading Petipa to withdraw himself from many of his duties. Some say that Teleyakovsky purposely sabotaged the production in order to force Petipa's retirement, but this cannot be proven. Teleyakovsky did, however, give Petipa the final push into retirement a year later when he cancelled the production of Petipa's final ballet, The Romance of the Rosebud and the Butterfly, two weeks before opening night. Following his retirement, the position of Ballet Master of the Imperial Ballet of St. Petersburg would go to Mikhail Fokin, another person on my list to cover for this series. Petipa lived out the remainder of his life with his family in a resort in Crimea, where he died at the age of 92. Most consider Marius Petipa one of the greatest choreographers of all time. Combining classicism with the purity of the French school and Italian virtuosity, he created over 50 ballets and reinterpreted many more. His work was thoroughly researched, closely collaborated, and much of it is still performed in some form today. Petipa elevated Russian ballet,
bringing it international recognition and laid the foundation upon which 20th century ballet built. For early access, access to my notes, and to help me decide what to tackle next, check out my Patreon linked below. And if you liked this, hit that thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you soon as I tackle another story from the stage.